Welcome to Wheaton College Graduate Virtual Chapel. This week, our special guest is the president of Wheaton, Philip Riken. But before we get to the president, let's reflect for just a moment on Psalm 117 from the message. Praise God, everybody. Applaud God, all people. His love has taken over our lives. God's faithful ways are eternal. Hallelujah. Dr. Riken, it's a joy to welcome you to the chapel. We're going to talk on a number of topics, but I'd like to start with the Psalms. What can you tell us about? Well, that's, the a, that's a big topic, Chaplain Greg. Uh, it's great to visit with you. Uh, good to see Jiva and Patty. And uh, I know these are tough times for everybody, but it's um, still a time we can, you know, encourage one another spiritually through conversation. I mean, I have so many things I could say about the Psalms. Here's one thing I'll say. I'm, I'm working on book five of the Psalms. I'm in a multi-year project of teaching, preaching those Psalms, eventually, uh, Lord willing, writing an uh, expositional commentary on these Psalms. And I have to say, I have never enjoyed um, the Psalms as much as I, I have this time. And I've never enjoyed teaching and preaching the Psalms as much and just had so gotten so much out of it from the study I'm doing. So I, I love the Psalms. And one of the things I love about the Psalms I mean, the thing I love most about the Psalms is I think if we read them in a Christ-centered way, we get a fuller picture of the, the ministry of the Son of God. Um, but one of the things I love about the Psalms is the way they grow through, grow with you through a lifetime of walking with the Lord, because every experience and every emotion, one way or another, is expressed in these Psalms. But you don't understand all of them as deeply until you've had those emotions or had those experiences. So until you've had you know, enemies, for example, or until you've been, you know, rescued or just all the things that David and the other psalmists um, went through. So it's not surprising that in this time of coronavirus, believers have identified particular psalms that have really helped them in this um, in this time of crisis. Uh, psalm 91 has been a psalm like that for our family. It's a psalm we've memorized together. And uh, Psalm 142, which I've uh, taught on recently, is a psalm like that. So there's a, there's a lot for us at any time of life, but including right now. Speaking of life, you were raised in Wheaton. You went to Wheaton College. You went off to seminary at Westminster, and then you got your doctorate in Oxford on some pure Ogen. Was it Boston? Is that correct? Yeah, Thomas Boston, Scottish Presbyterian pastor and theologian. Okay. And then you spent considerable time in Philadelphia as a pastor. Reflect back a little bit about what God, God taught you at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we were in ministry for 20 years um, in Philadelphia. It's a city we love. Um, I mean, there's just so many things I could comment. One thing I'll comment on is, um, you know, I started as um, associate minister of preaching there. I was still in my 20s. I had had very little experience preaching at all, but here I was preaching every week in our Sunday evening services. And I just learned so much from the other pastors on our staff. You know, the pastor was so gifted at public prayer. The pastor was so gifted at uh, visiting people in the hospital and walking with, walking through a crisis with people. Um, I just really saw early on the value of being in a team ministry setting where you can rely on the gifts of others, but also learn from the gifts of others. So, you know, I think that was something. Another thing, um, you know, we live very close to the church in downtown Philadelphia and really tried to live our life in that community, raise our family in that community, and um, just trying to live an integrated life where church, family, school for the kids, neighborhood, just all fit together in a coherent way where we were really invested in the life of that community. I remember a kid, uh, a kid that went to the Christian school where our kids went, went home one day and he complained to his mother. He said, mom, it's all the same. It's like, uh, I'm just I'm like tired of it. it's all the same. And she said, what do you mean? It's all the same. And he's like, I go to, I go to church and what, you know, they're telling me there, what I get at home, what I get at school, it's all the same. And she said, yeah, it's all the same. That's this is the kind of, you know, Christian life we're trying to build you up in. Um, that's the kind of rich family life we lived in in Philadelphia. The other thing I'll just say about city ministry is there's always all kinds of challenges, um, ethical challenges, political challenges, racial challenges, socioeconomic challenges. I mean, just all these issues 
And, you know, the Bible speaks to all of those issues. We have a uh, theology that addresses every issue in life. Um, we have a, a call to Christian response in every area of life. And I, I just love the complexity and richness of, of urban life and doing gospel ministry in that kind of context. Before we get to you as president of Wheaton College, you're also a writer. You've written about 30 books. I'll try to be specific. What's your favorite Philip Riken book? Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of like asking what your favorite child is. So I, I think really the book that's my favorite is the book that I'm working on right now, because that's the cutting edge of what you're learning. So, um, you know, I like I like different things that I've worked on for for different reasons. What I will say is so I do a variety of different kinds of writing. One of the kinds of things I've done is, is write ex expositional commentaries on various books of the Bible. And what I learned to love with that through that is not the book that I was writing, but the book that I was studying. So, um, you know, when I think about some of the great book projects I've been involved in, what I think about is, you know, what it, what it was like to study the whole book of Jeremiah and teach all the way through, what I learned from Exodus, you know, what it was like to get into Galatians, just, you know, these other books of the Bible. Um, then I'll say the, the other thing I'll just mention, I did a little book that's had a much bigger impact than the size of the book. It's a little book called Art for God's Sake. And it was a book in which I was trying to help Christians who didn't appreciate the arts understand the calling of artists as a legitimate God honor, legitimate God honor and calling, and to help people who are in the art world understand where their Christian colleagues were coming from. Like what, what was art all about for them? Why were they passionate about art? And it's just a book because artists get so little encouragement from the church, frankly. Um, you know, people have really appreciated the book and I'll, I'll get notes and hey, in fact, I'm going to have a conversation later today with somebody that was really helped by that book. Um, so those are just a couple of things uh, to mention, you know, different books, you like the cover better than others. Um, there are all kinds of reasons to like different books. Well, now you have been the president of Wheaton for a decade. Is that correct? Yes, 10 years. And I would hazard a guess this has been one of the more interesting of those 10 years. Yeah, I, I've got a friend. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you who it is. It's uh, Leith Anderson, who formerly was president of the National Association of Evangelicals, very um, highly respected pastor and Christian leader in the United States. He said to me one time, you have such interesting problems. And uh, I don't particularly, I don't want to have interesting problems. In fact, I don't want to have problems at all. Um, I just want to live a quiet life and, um, you know, nurture people, see people grow through the gospel. Um, but no, this is a really tough season uh, for all of us. Um, if we are in a place where we have shelter and we have the technology to carry on this conversation, and particularly so if we know the Lord and have his grace working in our lives, we are among the highly privileged. So there's, uh, you know, great, great suffering and loss in the world um, through death, through disease, through financial trouble. Uh, these are very difficult times. And they are difficult times for colleges and universities because we bring people together. Uh, we do life on life discipleship. We live worship study together. And those are the things that are more dangerous for us right now. So um, figuring out how to carry on with our academic work so that our students uh, are not delayed in getting the preparation that they need and being ready to make the full kingdom impact that God is, is planning for them to make. Um, that's the mission that we need to sustain right now. President Riken, uh, I just wanted to hear like you being the president of Wheaton College, one of the most reputed institutions in the world, what, do, what are those distinctive Christian leadership skills a Christian leader or a minister like you uh, would really try to hone during this time? Yeah, so it's a good question, Jeeva. Yeah, Wheaton is well known. Even in India, people know about Wheaton mm -hmm. College, I think. Uh, at least that's what I, I discovered when I when I traveled there. You know, I, I think your question about like, what can we learn from about leadership in this particular moment? Um you know, to some degree depends on the specific place where God has called you to lead. But I think a couple of things are really called for. Number one is um, what is hope giving for people is not when you minimize a problem. 
It is not hope giving to give people um, the hope of uh, blessings or benefits that you cannot actually deliver. So what's really hope giving for people is someone who's honest about the extent of the challenges that we're facing, looking down the road a bit and saying, hey, here's how tough it's going to be. But here is how faithful God is going to be. And here is what we are doing to get ready for that moment. I think that's that's hope giving. Um, but early on, I, I just wanted to make sure nobody needed to waste any time worrying that I wasn't taking the coronavirus seriously enough or that Wheaton College wasn't taking it. Nobody needs to waste any time worrying about that. We're taking it as seriously as we possibly can and um, planning with that kind of perspective in, in mind. I think uh, people need to be reminded of the faithfulness of God in, in fresh ways in a crisis situation. I also think, um, you know, one of the things I did at home early on is, you know, I said to my children, um, look, I think in the next few days, the governor is going to announce shelter in place. That's the direction all of this is heading. We're going to start now. We're coming home. We need to, um, you know, in the health interests of others, we need to be careful about spreading germs. Uh, we need to adjust to a new, a new lifestyle. And this is not going to be short. This isn't going to be over in a couple of weeks. This is going to be March and it's going to be April, and it's going to be May, and we're going to get into the summer. So that, um, you know, and, and trying to build a sense of resiliency and ultimately hope for the future, but not by minimizing problems, actually by, by um, you know, dealing with them with their, with their true severity. Um, obviously, prayerfully, working in collaboration with other leaders, um, really noticing, okay, who is feeling the strain? trying to anticipate, but also notice, like, who, who am I noticing? They just, they're not as patient with people as they usually are. I can tell that person is really having a hard time right now. This is a good time for me to just ask, you know, how things are going at home and things like that. Um, the other thing, I mean, there's just so many things that, you know, we could talk about in this present um, moment of crisis. Another thing that, that we've tried to priority, prioritize in some of our own leadership relationships at the college is being attentive to the fact that some of our key leaders live alone. Some live in families, and that has its own set of challenges, particularly a lot of faculty with small children. That's, that's really tough. It's also really tough to live alone. So how do we need to structure our work? Um, in, you know, Just for one example, my immediate team, we spend an extra half hour a week just in conversation, personal conversation, catching up on how people are doing. Boy, in the usual every day of Wheaton College life, I don't have the kind of time to just sit around and just visit for half an hour, but we thought that was particularly important for people, you know, living at home alone, and, and that was important for resiliency. So that's just one example of, you know, caring for and attending to the people, you know, in your community. Um, then the last thing I'll say is trying to anticipate problems down the road. Um, you know, early on in this crisis, one of the things I said to leaders at the college is, the thought that crosses your mind today and you feel like, oh, we don't have to worry about that today. Tomorrow, somebody's going to ask you about that. And the day after that, they're going to expect an answer to that question. So you might as well be thinking about those things today. Um, and that was true, particularly when the crisis was very fast moving um, early on. But this has been you know, an amazing opportunity for, for leadership. Um, it's nice to have a problem that's bigger than anybody can handle. Everybody knows it. They know they're going to have to pull together. Um, you know, there's certain advantages with the really big crisis. Um, but those are, I think, some of the things that we're learning. And of course, we're learning that we're not meant to have virtual conversations. We're meant to live embodied lives in the physical presence of other believers for worship and for daily Christian life. Um, and I think our, you know, hunger and appreci hunger for that appreciation of it has really grown. I think that's probably true worldwide for the church all over the world. Thank you for that message, uh, President Reich. And it is inspiring, you know, for all of us who, who desire to, to become leaders in our home countries or, or wherever we are. Definitely a lot to learn from that. I'd, I'd like to use this opportunity to uh, ask you a question that would give a uh, uh, some words for all, all our grad students who are uh, listening to us right now and watching our virtual grad chapel. And from the heart of, of the president of Wheaton College to the heart of the grad students, what would, from your perspective, be some words that would describe, that you would like 
to describe uh, a graduate student from Wheaton College? Yeah, so that's a great, great question, Patty. They told me you asked really good questions. So, um, you know, one thing I'll say is um, right now, resilient. Love to see Wheaton College graduate students and alumni of the graduate school really resilient. Um, what brings resilience is a lot of hope and confidence in what God can do. Um, what brings resilience is just healthy daily patterns of worship and rest, hard work, uh, exercise, you know, just kind of the basics of, of a God honoring life. Um, so, you know, I think that's one thing that I'm looking to see in our, in our Wheaties uh, right now. And I see it in a lot of our alumni. I mean, um, just in touch with alumni in ministry in various places around the world, what they're going through right now. And I, I sense a real hopefulness, um, trust in what God can do. Uh, another thing I'm always looking for in our um, graduate students and then as they move out into the world, and th this is the way I like to think of it, um, you are getting ready to make the full difference in the world for Jesus Christ that somebody with your gifts and experiences can make, the full difference that you can make. Um, so what kind of approach does that require then during your time at grad, in graduate school? Well, um, you know, your primary calling is to be a student and to find a way, even with the ministry commitments, the friendships, for some of the work. Um, did I say ministry commitments? Family commitments also, they can, you know, loom really large for us and just the obligations of friendship. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a complete life. You have to put it all together. But the center of gravity for that is the once in a lifetime opportunity to learn. And um, just having a really um, wholehearted, joy-filled approach to that um, so that you, because you're going to be drawing on the things that you're learning from your reading, from your faculty members, from your conversations, you're going to be drawing on that for a lifetime. Um, so you want to make a really deep investment. Um, and, and, and the way I think about that investment, it's not really about your personal growth. It's actually what you owe to all the people that you will serve. Um, there's a sense in which you, you have a holy obligation to them to get the most out of the experiences that you, you are having right now, because it's for their benefit that you're here. So, you know, whether it's in a church-based context or in, um, you know, counseling practice, whether it's here in the United States, or whether it's for some of our, our graduates, many of them, you know, returning home to a place of ministry, it's those people that you want to have in mind um, for the investments that you're making in your in your education right now. I'd like to turn the conversation slightly. What does Philip Reichen do when he's not president of We yeah. College? Tell us so about I do, hobbies and interests. Yeah, so I do whatever my children are doing. So that's number one. I uh, love to read. People won't be surprised by that. Um, really enjoy, particularly in the springtime, doing doing as much birding as I can do. So I've been out probably half a dozen times, maybe as many as eight times, um, pretty early in the morning. Had a phenomenal day in West DuPage Woods last week. Um, saw 10 different species of migratory warblers coming through the woods. Um, so that was, you know, super exciting morning. I've seen a bunch of birds this spring that I've never seen before. So um, that's something I enjoy. Another thing that we really enjoy as a family, and I particularly enjoy, is strategy games. So that's something we enjoy doing, um, you know, in the evening sometimes as well. So, and then, um, you know, I, I love to play sports. So that's part of my regular recreation. I'm, you know, without basketball or soccer right now, which is really tough, um, have uh, become reacquainted with a tennis racket in the last few weeks. Um, so, you know, enjoy getting exercise. Lisa and I were out on an hour long uh, bike ride this morning. So I talked to a mission executive re uh, recently who said you're a very aggressive basketball player. Yeah. So I'd have to hear who that, uh, <laughs> we'll have who to that talk person online. is. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's go back to birds and books. What's your favorite bird? Uh, my favorite bird is probably the Western tanager, which is a, we don't have them in this part of the country. You have to go out to the Rocky Mountains to see those. Uh, but they are just beautiful birds with a beautiful song. So, um, you know, they may be at the, they may be at the top of my list. Another bird I love is the Cardinal because I'm a St. Louis Cardinals baseball fan. So <laughs> the Cardinals are great birds and they've got a great song and we see plenty of them around here. So. 
How did you get into birding? I had a phenomenal fifth grade teacher, Marilyn Himmel, who's a Wheaton alum. And, um, you know, so we learned about the birds in class and we had recordings of the different songs. And I did a report on the white breasted nuthatch, which is also a great bird. But um, she took us out to the Morton Arboretum, which is, is near campus early on a Saturday morning, you know, kind of at the end of our birding time. And I just saw and heard things I'd never seen and heard before, because until somebody educates you and you know what to listen for and what to look for, and it, you know, just a whole, whole world opened up and, you know, I just, I just loved it. And, you know, I've done a decent amount of reading um, about birds, not a huge amount, but it's, um, you know, it's definitely, definitely one of my hobbies. My children can tell you that because, you know, one way or another, they kind of all know, okay, yeah, I got to go out once with dad this spring. So did you ever have a conversation about birds with John Stott? No. So, um, oh. you know, John Stott has a really good book, um, something like The Birds Are Friends or something like that, with his own photographs of, of birding he did all over the world. So I, I've benefited from some of his um, insights, but never had a chance for a personal conversation with him. Maybe you did in Hong Kong. In London. In London. One last question. Our audience includes graduate students and alumni, but also some grad, some students who are getting ready to start Wheaton in the fall. What words do you have for the student about to begin his Wheaton or her Wheaton? Yeah, so we're, we're getting ready for you. Lord willing, uh, we will be on campus for classes. We're going to work as hard as we possibly can, do what we can do um, to make that happen. I will say this, and this is for our current students as well. This is a great time to be a student, honestly. Um, you're thinking, oh, this is a really tough time to be a student. I mean, it's a tough, this is a tough time for everybody. Tough, tough if you've had to do remote learning. I mean, that, that's really, really tough um, in, in all kinds of ways. But you're in a time of preparation. And when there's a global crisis, preparing for the future is one of the best things that you can be doing. And even with all the distractions, and you may feel like I can't concentrate as well, I can't get as much done. I think that's true for everybody. This is still a great time to be a student. It's a great time to be a graduate student. So um, I, I would just really encourage people who are in graduate school right now contemplating it to, to consider that a blessing um, right now and realize it's a favorable position. Not everyone is blessed uh, the way that, that you are right now. We have a number of people who are praying for you daily. How can we pray for the president of Wheaton College and for Phil Riken? Yeah, so thank you for that. I mean, just, um, you know, pray for the college, pray for its its well-being through this crisis. I always ask people to pray for just that. I've got five children, now seven children because two of them are married, now also a grandchild on the way. So just praying for just the work of God's grace in the lives of our children. Um, there are things that that have been challenging about their lives in various ways. Um, it's not easy to be in a ministry family, particularly one where there are lots of people that think they know who you are, even if you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the real blessings is that we have many, many people that pray for us. And, and I think we see that in the lives of our lives of our children. So, um, you know, I think those two things. Then the other thing I'll say, and you know, you, you've been in pastoral ministry a long time, Greg, so you, you understand this as well. And a lot of our graduate students will as well, particularly our international students or students that have already been in a ministry career, have taken time out. You know how, how tough a lot of things are in ministry. And you also know some of the toughest things are the things that people don't know about because you can't really share them. So just some of the, you know, hidden burdens, um, I think is always a really good thing to pray for, for people we know who are in leadership. Do my distinguished colleagues have any questions for the president? No, I, I don't have a question, but I do want to say something and use this opportunity just really on behalf of all the graduate students just to thank you for your leadership. And um, as an international student, if there's something that I value a lot during this time, it's just seeing Wheaton College's leadership come alongside everybody at the student body and, and how all the responses we transition to online learning and preparing for what the fall would look like. And I think, you know, what we've seen on staff and faculty has been a reflection of your leadership. And I just want to say thank you on behalf yeah. of everybody. Thank you, sir. I mean, that's been totally a team effort. You know, there's a big big group of people, but um, you know, it is, it is my responsibility to encourage our leaders. So uh, thank you for that encouraging word, Patty. Thank you so much. We do have a few minutes. I'd like to go back to team for a second. 
you have an incredible team. And Sheila uh, Caldwell was with us two weeks ago, and we've been getting so many comments from just her wisdom and her, her love and her godliness and her willing to listen. How do you build a team? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, one of the interesting things about leadership is um, that's a constantly evol evolving question because your team is facing new challenges and that has an impact on your team. A lot of teams in a healthy institution, you're preparing people, developing people, and then they have a different calling that they go out and pursue. And so if you're if you're an effective leader, your team is going to be is going to be changing. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I just feel like there are a lot of things I could do better um, in that area. But I, I think um, a couple of things that are to me important. One is that uh, prayer is a significant part of our work together as a team. Another is that we have experiences of giving and receiving forgiveness from one another. Um, inevitably, if we're working closely in relationships, we're going to have situations that call for that. So um, that's important in family life. It's also important in, in team leadership. Um, it's also really important for team members to know that when they're really having a challenge or a struggle, you're there for them. Um, you're there with a solution or some kind of practical help and in any team, you're going to have to make some demands on your other team members from time to time, and, and you're going to have to make some withdrawals from their resources. So you need to be making a lot of investments in them so that they're you know resilient for that as well. Another thing that um, I think is team building is if you're the primary leader on a team, not assuming what other people on your team need from, from you, but asking. Mm. So um, I like to ask, okay, are you sharing this with me for information? Do you need some ideas? Um, do you want some, uh, you know, some practical suggestions for how to solve this problem? Um, or is there another way to help? And most of the time, people on my teams, they don't actually need my help. Um, not the way that maybe I assume, like I'm some amazing problem solver for, for them. A lot of times they just need somebody to listen and they need to process kind of their own thinking about something. So, um, I would just say not assuming that you already know what your team needs. If you ask, I would have heard that 30 years ago. I think that's <laughs> key insight. I was fascinated that you talked about your team at 10th Presbyterian. Now, James Boyce was a very famous preacher. I expected to hear you hear, expected to have you talk about him, but you talked about the team and you certainly are a team player here. So that's something that I really commend you for. Thank you. Yeah, no, I was privileged to work alongside James Montgomery Boyce for five years. Very well-known minister, prolific author, um, outstanding church leader. And I did I did learn a lot of things from, from James Boyce as well, mainly by observation. Um, and we don't have time to get into a long uh, conversation about that. But there, there's no doubt that, um, you know, James Boyce has put a little stamp on my ministry as well. And I remain very close relationship with his family, particularly his, his wife, Linda. And um, in fact, recently had the privilege of bringing into print uh, his commentary on Revelation um, as an editorial project. So, Well, I'm going to press you on this. What did you learn that's helping you be a leader by being a follower? So, I mean, I just think that's so important, actually. You learn how to be a good number one by learning how to be a good number two. And, um, you know, I think um, if you're in that secondary role, there is a place for raising questions. C occasionally there may be a, you know, a place for um, really saying, you know, I feel like I really need to say, I think this is the wrong decision. But um, you are primarily there to facilitate another person's um, vision. And that's as collaborative as that leader wants it to be. Um, I really like what um, Paul says to Timothy. This is in 1 Timothy. I don't, don't know the chapter and verse, but probably in chapter 5. And he's saying to Timothy, you should treat younger men as brothers. And you should treat older men as fathers. Hmm. So if all the older men treat the younger men as brothers, that's so affirming of them. It elevates them. It gives them a sense of well-being and it prepares them for the next stage of leadership. But the younger men in those relationships, and the same thing would apply in relationships between women as well, between a mentor and the younger woman that she's mentoring, the younger person should not mistake that relationship as truly one 
where I should treat it as we're just like a brother. I should still have that sense of respect and deference. And what that looks like um, in different cultures can be very different. So I think what respect looks like, what it means to be a brother, that you know, there are cultural dimensions of it. But there's just a really solid core principle that the apostle gives to us there. And um, if we put that into practice, then when we're in a secondary role or in a following role, um, we're serving well the person that we're following. We're learning a lot of things from them. I mean, this is the biblical pattern for leadership. It's just the way Jesus did discipleship. It's the way Elijah did discipleship with Elisha. Um, you know, it's just uh, learning alongside someone life by life. Patty and Jeeva, I hope you were taking good notes because I think you got some valuable lessons in leadership. And we can't wait to see what God has in store for the two of you and for the graduates of Wheaton College. And Phil, thank you so much for taking time from a very busy schedule. What was that quote you were talking about? Uh, ministry of horror is a vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're in ministry, you always, there's always more to do than you could possibly do. So I tell our students, both graduate and undergraduate, you feel like you're really, you know, pressed and stretched and you don't have time to fit it all in. Believe me, these are the good days. Um, I mean, I, you know, the life of a graduate student is tough in lots of ways, but it's, it's not as tough as life in ministry. So you're getting well prepared. Thank you. Could you close us with a benediction? Or yeah, I'd love to. So this is for Jiva. It's for Patty. It's for all of our graduate students, especially. It's for our faculty, uh, for you, Greg. Greg. Uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you with a deep awareness of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you with a deep knowledge um, of what it means to be a beloved daughter or beloved son of the Most High God. And may the Lord bless you with a life full of the Holy Spirit so that you can be resilient for the challenges of today and tomorrow as you wait for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.